We thank all of you, or whichever medium you are watching this presentation on. Uh, the talk is the need to belong. And some people may or may not know very much about your family history. Others may knew, know a great deal more than maybe you, you need to. Uh, but there are always stories, always curiosities. And um, it, when you think about it from a statistical standpoint, and I, I found this in, in my research, you go back 20 generations, you have more than a million relatives. And you go back 30 generations, it's a billion, and you get to 40, it's a trillion. So there are lots of relatives out there. And uh, this, this is something, usually there's one person in the family who is the family historian. And my, my mother's people didn't really keep very good track of any of their history, but my father's sister, Aunt Miriam, did. And I never really had much of this in school. And sadly, history is, you know, very general, generalized. But then you realize that you have a family who might have participated in some historic event or other. And when I got to the age I was starting to ask those questions, uh, my mother, who was not exactly a fan of my Aunt Miriam, my, my father's sister, said, you know, you really need to go talk to your Aunt Miriam. She's done a lot of research, and I'm sure she'd be very willing to share what she has learned. And even though I knew my aunt and uncle, and we used to see them a few times a year, as soon as I uh, initiated a conversation wanting to know the family history, it was like the doors were swung open. And even though I have five cousins who do a, a various amount you know, little bits of pieces of their genealogy. It was like I was the chosen person, and all of a sudden, I had reams of information that she had collected over the years from her own research, from others, pictures, artifacts, you name it. And she she always told me, you know, you you should belong to the Mayflower Society. We we have a Mayflower ancestor, Stephen Hopkins, and. Um, you could you could belong to that. And well, when you're young, you don't always have time to go into all of those things. But in later years, uh, I, I started taking an interest. And I figured, well, my aunt is a member, so I should just be able to come right in on her, on her uh, uh, apron strings, as it were. Except my aunt was an honorary member of the Vermont Mayflower Society. She had written an article for their newsletter back sometime in the late 60s, early 70s. And she said they probably thought of her as some little old lady, even though she was in her late 40s, early 50s. And they just gave her this honor. And when the historian at that time for the Vermont Mayflower Society said, you have no documentation for your aunt because she was an honorary member, so you're going to have to prove it. Well, obviously, they don't accept stories as proof of, of your membership. And we were under a, <clears throat> a bit of a false premise um, because Stephen Hopkins, his daughter Constance, married a Nicholas Snow. And the presumption was that it was a straight shot from Nicholas Snow down to my fourth great-grandfather, Timothy Snow, and then his son, Hiram, and then their daughter, Harriet. Well, th there was some anecdotal information, but basically from you know here down to a James Snow of Putney, it was valid information. But it presumed that Timothy was a son of James, which was not the case. And so therefore, this information, which my aunt insisted was the line, proved not to be the case. And so I got a little discouraged on this because it's like, well, now maybe we can't belong. But sometimes you have to consult other sources. And even though family, uh, published family histories are not always accurate, they can give you clues to other things. And so instead of my great-great-grandmother's side, Harriet Snow, we went up my great-great-grandfather's side, and there was the line. And it came down from the same Stephen Hopkins and Constance 
but through a daughter of theirs, Mary Snow, and through the Paines, through the Clevelands into the Adamses, and this branch of Adams was from uh, Henry Adams of Braintree, Massachusetts. He and his wife, Edith Squire, were the patriarchs of the more affluent Adamses in America, including the presidents John and John Quincy Adams, Calvin Coolidge also comes from this line, as does First Lady Mamie Dowd Eisenhower. And so it comes down through to a Samuel Adams, my fourth great grandfather from Canterbury, Connecticut, distant cousins to all of those affluent Adams as mentioned, and then down through to Charles Wesley Adams, and then, of course, to myself. And so this proved out. And as it always is the case, sometimes you find this line was already proven by a distant cousin of mine, which I didn't find out until like three or four years after I had joined the Mayflower Society. But you know, it was a very good exercise because it's more than just knowing or having somebody give you something. When It's always good when you can get somebody to give you that heritage, that information, but if you research it yourself, it's like years ago asking, how do you spell such and such a word? And if you had parents who were wanting to challenge you, they'd say, there's the dictionary, look it up. And, and if you do look it up, you'll always remember, you'll always have that information. And so I was able to join the Vermont Mayflower Society in 2001. My aunt was actually the speaker that year and somehow conned me into driving her to the old dog team tavern in Middlebury. And unbeknownst to me, uh, that was when it was announced in public that I had officially become a member of, of the Mayflower Society. And then maybe five years after that, I joined a subgroup of this, which is the Pilgrim Hopkins Heritage Society. Uh, never been to a meeting. I paid a life membership, and, and those were the only societies I had until the fall of 2018. And my, 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 incidentally, my brother has really no interest in any of this, even though we share the same information. But his wife, my sister-in-law, who also claims to be a Mayflower descendant, but will never prove it, but she's always kind of saying, you know, uh, Stephen Hopkins was at Jamestown before he was in Plymouth. And there is a Jamestown Society, and you could belong to that. So um, the fall of 2018, uh, I, I did start investigating that. And yes, he is, is a, a qualifying ancestor for the Jamestown Society. But they did not accept approved Mayflower Society applications to join. So once again, you have that proving. And by proving, it's primary documentation birth, marriage, death certificates, registrations. Uh, for, for anybody proving a Mayflower ancestor, you have these silver books, and that uh, chronicles at least the first five generations from the primary passenger down. Uh, but the Jamestown Society does accept the silver books for those first five generations. And usually, I find you can go back from yourself four or five generations, but it's always the ones in the middle trying to make that connection. Uh, it sometimes bears a little more research, but I, I became a member of the Jamestown Society in early 2019. I then discovered First Families of Vermont, which I had never heard of. I qualified for, for that in spades, and a number of ancestors who settled in Vermont in over a 200-year period. Uh, there are six criteria. You have an ancestor who is either born, settled, uh, owned land here, or was involved in some civil, military, or commercial enterprise uh, from 1609 all the way up to the day before Vermont joined the Union. And then there was a brand new society that took off in 2019, and that was the descendants of American farmers. And that's uh, for some people, had a number of ancestors who didn't qualify for any of, of the major ones, like Mayflower, uh, the sons or the daughters of the American Revolution, but most everybody has at least one or two farmers, and it is surprising. This started with 
two sisters, retired airline stewardesses in Texas, and it has grown to, it's pushing in on about 1,500 members nationwide. And I think that they have proven between primary and supplemental ancestors, um, at least, um, I'm, I'm going to say more than 2,400 farming ancestors. And they also have a scholarship program to encourage young people to go into farming. So, and, and incidentally, if you get more than 10 supplementals, you get your own binder. And there is my name right on this corner here. And I, I think the, the ladies who founded this society are the record holders. I think between them, they have proven 57 farming ancestors. So, uh, and, and now they have started recognizing farmers' wives, who also played a very pivotal role in, in any farming operation. But again, this, this brings to light and it shadows, it p puts a spotlight on uh, people who are very instrumental in, in our American history. Well, then we had the pandemic that came along. And um, so, you know, I had a grand total of six of these lineage societies, and there wasn't a great deal to do. And so I was able to do research, and, you know, you're able to go along and you can find, like Stephen Hopkins, for instance, he qualifies you for a number of these lineage societies. I did mention Jamestown and the Pilgrim Hopkins Heritage Society, but his primary occupation in Plymouth Colony was as a tavern keeper, and there is a group called Flagon and Trencher, descendants of colonial inn and tavern keepers. But wait, because mail was often delivered to taverns, he also qualifies you for the descendants of early postmasters. And he was also considered one of the founders of North America as a signer of the Mayflower Compact. And so again, one ancestor can get you into all of these different societies. And, and, and that was the case. You know, you'd think you've got all the ones you're eligible for, and not so. There, there are quite a few more of these which might highlight a particular occupation, a particular place. Maybe they were in some military service, uh, some sort. And, and then you find other very affluent ancestors. And this was on my grandmother's side through Fars, Wilder, Dunster, um, Wade and then Dudley. Governor Thomas Dudley came as a deputy colonial governor in 1630 in the Winthrop fleet under uh, the original uh, governor, John Winthrop. He eventually succeeds him as the second colonial governor. Now, now we're into a branch where we have royalty and nobility and Governor Dudley very well documented to, for you to join all of these old world societies. And I had sort of known, and again, thanks to my sister-in-law, I knew about the baronial order of the Magna Carta. And the ancestor of uh, Governor Dudley's was a Robert Fitzwalter, who was the head of the barons who presented the Magna Carta for King John to sign at Runnymede in 1215. As it turns out, I am actually related to several of these Magna Carta sureties including King John, because I go back to uh, his, I believe, grandfather, William the Conqueror. And so, once again, you know, 2020, just before everything starts to shut down, I had paperwork in. Um, and when, when you think about it, uh, you, you go back to Thomas Dudley or whomever is considered your gateway American ancestor. This is someone an immigrant ancestor with noted um, heritage of royalty, nobility, Magna Carta, etc. And then you go back uh, to get to Thomas Dudley. He was my eighth great grandfather. Robert Fitzwalter was my 21 times great grandfather. So you can figure that's 24 generations that you have to get back in order to get there. In that entire process, most of everything from uh, Governor Dudley up is documented in books that are accepted by the baronial order of the Magna Carta. 
And so from him down to myself, it, it had to be good old primary documentation. Um, but, but by the same token, in that entire range, the only thing holding me back was a death certificate for my great-grandfather who died in 1944 in New York City. He was kind of the black sheep of the family. He had abandoned my great-grandmother and my young grandmother when my grandmother was only three or four years old. And he wanders all over and ends up in New York City where he dies. Uh, try getting a death certificate from New York City. And first they send you to the Department of Health and then, well, no, it was before 1948 so you can go to the archives. Mm -hmm. And I get his death certificate. It's a Thursday afternoon in early February 2020. And I get it. I make the copy. I have all of my other documentation. I send it in by priority uh, envelope. And by late Sunday afternoon, the registrar for BOMC sent me an email saying that I had been approved. Uh, because again, most of this electronically I had sent in and he just needed to uh, verify the information. And he said, but wait, you know, um, Robert Fitzwalter was briefly in the Crusades, so you qualify for the military order of the Crusades. And oh, by the way, another ancestor of Thomas Dudley was Folk V, the king of Jerusalem, who was the founder of the Knights Templar and was in the First Crusades, so you can belong to that one, and so forth and so on. Uh, we end up with quite a number of things, the descendants of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company, uh, the Winthrop Society, which originally I thought you had to be a descendant of John Winthrop, but anyone who came in the Winthrop fleet between 1620 and 1640 is when they allow that time period. Uh, Lady Godiva was a, a mutual uh, ancestor of ours. And the Order of the Norman Conquest, uh, D Governor Dudley on his own right was a magistrate, so he, uh, he qualifies you for the colonial and antebellum bench and bar, as well as first families of Massachusetts. And a new one that came out, I think, just last year, the um, descendants of founders of places of worship. Uh, Governor Dudley was member number three in the church at Boston. So again, you, you have all of these things, and most of these are lineal societies, which means it is a so many times removed great-grandfather or grandmother, but there are societies that you can prove collateral membership in. And so for those of us who aren't descendants of presidents, or first ladies or Supreme Court justices, we can still belong. Calvin Coolidge, again, as I mentioned earlier, we, we go back through, well, specifically through him. Um, I proved Henry Squire of England, who was a mutual ancestor to several presidents and first ladies. Obviously, the presidents John and John Quincy Adams, uh, Mamie Dowd Eisenhower, President William Howard Taft all come from the same mutual ancestor, Henry Squire. But others of these, President Grover Cleveland, out of my Mayflower line, there was a, a Josiah Cleveland. Moses Cleveland was a mutual ancestor, and that's what you do. You prove from the mutual ancestor to yourself. You don't have to prove to the president or first lady as long as the registrar accepts that that is a mutual ancestor. And then Herbert Hoover, um, we, we share Governor Thomas Dudley as a mutual ancestor. Reverend John Lothrop or Lathrop of Situate, Massachusetts. Uh, we share Ulysses S. Grant. Probably a couple of these you may or may not have heard of. Martha Devotion uh, Huntington, wife of Samuel Huntington, who was the president of the Continental Congress from Connecticut and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Mary Fay Robinson, wife of second governor of the Republic of Vermont, Moses Robinson. Edith, Ker uh, Edith Kermit Kiro Roosevelt, second wife of President Theodore Roosevelt. And a lady you may not recognize by the name, Aunt Frances Robbins, who changed her name to Nancy Davis, uh, then became Nancy Reagan, all descendants of this Reverend John Lothrop. And as I mentioned, 
There is also the IX or the nine, which are Supreme Court um, relationships. Uh, William Howard Taft, again, as he was both president and chief justice of the Supreme Court. Oliver Wendell Holmes, we share Thomas Dudley. And then I was very surprised to learn about Salmon P. Chase, who I always think of principally as only being Abraham Lincoln's Treasury Secretary, but he was nominated by Lincoln to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 1864. Well, he and I share mutual ancestor Jonathan Wade, who was an early tavern keeper from Ipswich, Massachusetts. The Wades intersect with the Dudleys and the Dunsters, and so that's, that's how that all comes uh, to, to play. So I went from having two originally prior to 2018 to then having six in 2019 and now currently up to 46 of these societies. And uh, it's had to get to the point I have to create a spreadsheet so I keep them all in track. Um, that's also, it's also good to have the information, um, those who are not lineal, how you connect. But then I started working on supplementals. Now, a primary ancestor is the one that gets you in the society. But what if you have, for instance, more than one Mayflower ancestor? You can prove as many as you can prove. And those additional are called supplementals. And uh, I think currently my largest number of supplementals is in the descendants of American farmers, where I think I have 21 currently, along with my primary, and then I did a memorial membership for my grandfather. And then you realize that you're all connected with all of these other people who share some of the same ancestors, some of the same vocations, uh, who might have settled in some of the same areas. Um, and, and, and you realize now, while everybody has a family story, not everybody knows every nook and cranny. And even for some of us who have been doing this, I'm still finding new things out every single day. And I, and I keep, keep trying to find more and more things. But especially during those, what, what I think could be rightly called the dark days of all of the shutdowns and the pandemic, I, I couldn't go out anywhere playing music. I couldn't interact with people. This was one of those ways of keeping sanity and also documenting history, learning more things, as that's one of the things we're supposed to be, even those who are older. We're in the school of lifelong learning. You're never done learning. The day you stop learning is the day they better have a hole dug for you. You're always learning something new. You're always finding some new development. And uh, many of my relatives who had been doing this sort of thing uh, were, were amazed. But, but again, it's, it's really not any brilliance. It's really just this persistence. And you keep looking, and you keep searching, and you keep either trying to prove or disprove certain things. Um, but in the 20 some odd years I've been in the Mayflower Society, I, I still can't prove any more than the two that I have, which is Stephen Hopkins and his daughter Constance, even though there were all of these rumors. I'm still searching. I'm still looking. There are all of these little whispers, but they never seem to, to come to anything. Um, but I'm, I'm going to leave you with a, a little excerpt. I'm sure you're all familiar with the TV series The Waltons, but uh, Earl Hamner Jr., who, who wrote um, the original uh, books and inspired that TV series. And well, actually, before that, there was a, there was a movie that, that had a different name that then became The Waltons. Uh, he was always somebody very interested and very concerned about his heritage. And I'm, I'm going to share this little excerpt, which was from one of those Walton episodes. I think it was from a Founders Day program. There is something within us that tells us all we will ever know about ourselves. There is a destiny that tells us where we will be born, where we will live, and where we will die. I have walked the land in the footsteps of all my fathers and mothers, back in time to where the first one trod and stopped, saw sky, felt wind, bent to touch Mother Earth, and called this home. And we, their heirs, walk the old paths, looking back in pride, in honored heritage, 
to hear its laughter and its song, to grow, to stand, and be ourselves one day remembered. I have walked the land in the footsteps of all my fathers and mothers. I saw yesterday, and now look to tomorrow. Thank you. And if there are any questions or comments, those who are on television, I'm sorry, I can't see you, but any of those who are assembled, um, and this sort of thing. Uh, one question I was asked uh, was it over a month or so ago when I was interviewed for the Vermont Standard was, did you come across anything that would make you ashamed of your ancestors? Uh, did you find anyone who owned slaves, for instance? And, and I can say, no, I, I've never done that. But I said, you know, if, if you are offended by some of these things, good, because then you, as a descendant, are not going to be likely to repeat some of those things. Um, I, I don't believe in trying to whitewash them all as being either saints or completely sinners. You have to evaluate everybody on, on their own merits. And some of these people, again, had very little in the way of resources, like the pilgrim ancestors who came here. Uh, I don't think it was privilege that, you know, wiped out half of their numbers the first winter that they were here. You had 51 people who survived who have heirs that are recognized by the Mayflower Society, which represent 26 families. And out of those 26 families, it's estimated there are more than 35 million descendants worldwide, and most of those people don't know that they are connected. Um, but I, I was very pleased to see a, a number of my ancestors who were in uh, abolitionist roles, uh, who also defended people accused of witchcraft at Salem. Um, but also, you know, who among us would have just jumped in some rickety boat to come across the Atlantic just to escape religious persecution? The easiest thing would have been to just conform. And yet, these people believed so fervently in wanting a new land, wanting to stand by their values, that they were willing to give up every comfort, every luxury. And believe me, there was nothing here for social safety nets when they got here. Um, so. I, I think, again, everything needs to be examined, but um, we maybe in the course of this study, we all learned that these were all real people because you can, you can look at, uh, and, th and this is a copy of a typical application. Some of them, they start with the ancestor down or they start with you, the applicant, and work your way back. Uh, everything that is on here, again, has to be documented. And when you get down to the nitty gritty, I guess this is all that really amounts to is your name, date and place of birth, date and place of marriage, date and place of death. But when you study these people, you realize they were real people just like all of us, and they had hopes and fears, successes, failures. And um, you, you hopefully are able to maybe have a better grasp of something than just some general stereotype and realize that uh, some of these people were uh, to be very well commended, to be admired in many, many respects. So that, that, is, that is my story. Mm -hmm.